is good that we can come into the house of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible said, come into his courts with singing, with rejoicing. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I don't know, you guys excited to come into the house of the Lord? Amen. You know, when you, <laughs> amen, when you get up on Sunday morning, you excited to come into the house of the Lord? Praise the Lord. We should be excited to come into the house of the Lord. Coming into the house of the Lord should not be a, a boring thing. You know, we must be excited. You know, you have high expectation when we come, when we meet with the Lord. You see, coming in God's house is a time to fellowship with our brothers and our sisters. And it's a time to meet with the Lord in a corporate way. We meet him with the Lord. The Lord is in our midst. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pledges forevermore. We give God thanks. Praise the Lord. Let us remember those who are not here today. I don't know if it's just because of that little um, chilliness in the air. <laughs> the folks decide to stay home. <laughs> I don't, is, is, is this the coldest day in the year? <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> Amen. Welcome to Canada, folks who stay home. When you see them, tell them, welcome to Canada. <laughs> this is how Canada is. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We give the Lord thanks. We are happy um, that we can come again and open up the word of God. You know, we have a good thing going here in Street Gate Ministries. We may not be a big church, but we study the word of God. The word of God is very important to us here in this ministry and you know the bible tells us you know that job he regard the word of god more necessary than his daily meat his daily food and when we exalt god word in our life when we put the word of god first place in our life the word of god is our sword it's our shield it is our security it's the place where we went, run for shelter and encouragement, and we must really esteem God's word. Praise the Lord. Today we will pick up from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and uh, today we will try to finish up this chapter by the grace of God. We will start from verse 7 and try to take it right over to verse 18. Praise the Lord. See what the Lord will say to us as we open up the Holy Scriptures today. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here in your house. Thank you, Lord, for the congregation of your people. Thank you, Lord, for the testimony of your people. You place a song within our hearts, Lord, in spite of the situation that we might be facing. Thank you, Lord, because you are a healer. You are the healing balm in Gilead. Praise the name of the Lord. You are the healing oil in our life. Hallelujah. Thank you for the healing oil. Spiritual life, oh God, come afresh upon us. Your divine anointing, the burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God will rest upon us even as we open up the Holy Scriptures. Pray for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, a hunger and a thirst within the hearts of your people, Lord. Heal our hearts, our soul, our mind, our spirit. Have your way, we pray, Father, in Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Praise the Lord. We pick up from verse 7 in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? And that's a question. If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. So that's a very important question. Are we looking on things after the outward appearance? And uh, I don't know if you know it, but we are living in two worlds. We are living in the natural world, and we are living in the spiritual world. And, you know, things that are spiritual, you can't take the, the physical eyes to see the things that are spiritual. And it takes discernment. And God provides discernment for us as children of God that we can discern things. And as I was saying last week, you know, as a child of God, we ought not to wait until something happens in the physical realm before we can know what is going on. God give us spiritual insight. And uh, when we pray and we read the word of God, our spiritual senses develop. 
He's just like a, a baby. You know, I look at my granddaughter, Adia, you know, she is so smart and, you know, she's saying a lot of things, doing a lot of things. Sometimes she will just, you know, for instance, uh, I think it was last week she was home and we was going up the stairs, so I'm counting. I count from one to nine and I stop. <laughs> and <laughs> I didn't expect that she know what comes after nine and she's able to say ten, you know. And uh, uh, her spiritual, her physical senses is developing. And it is the same thing. God wants our spiritual senses to develop. And the way we um, train our, our spiritual senses, just like our, a child has to train their physical senses by reading books and uh, all those different things, educational stuff that they will be involved in, we have to be involved in things that will develop our spiritual senses. And it takes the word of God, it takes prayer, you know, to develop our spiritual senses. We're talking to God, we're listening to him through his words. Our spiritual senses will be developed. So Paul, he, he asks the question, do you look on things after the outward appearance? We have to look on things, you know, spiritually. We look on it physically too and we look on it spiritually. And uh, there's a lot of things that you can't see with the natural eyes, but with the spiritual eyes, you can see it. And he said, if any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we. Now what is happening here is that the false apostles and the false teachers in the Corinthians church, they were disrespecting the apostle Paul. And what they are saying is that the apostle Paul, he was not a genuine apostle. He was not a, 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 a truly genuine apostle and they were saying that they had a closer connection with God than the apostle Paul himself and uh, they are saying that they have a special connection with God and they were even claiming that they have special revelation they have special knowledge but you know if anybody should have any special connection with God it was supposed to be the apostle Paul because the apostle Paul met with the Lord Jesus Christ you remember when he was on the way to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, the Lord Jesus himself, God called to Paul from heaven. He said, Saul, his name was Saul. He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And when he heard that voice, he knew that that wasn't a, an ordinary earthly voice. He said, who art thou, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And the, the Lord um, blinded the eyes of the Apostle Paul and sent him to a, a location, you know. Uh, and then he sent his, um, the disciple Ananias uh, to, to go and speak to Paul. And the Lord gave him a special message. The Lord sent Paul to the Gentiles and he anointed him. And he told him that he's going to have to suffer many things for his name. So if anybody... Uh, should claim a special relationship with the Lord, it should have been the Apostle Paul. Also, we have that situation when the Apostle Paul, he gave an uh, um, you know, uh, explanation about a man who was taken up into the third heaven. He did not say it was him, but in reality, he was talking about himself. The Apostle Paul was taken up by God into the third heavens where the Lord was. And uh, the Lord showed him things, uh, uh, things that he could not even um, speak of. And because those things were so sacred, the Lord gave him a thorn in the flesh. You know, the, the messenger of Satan, you know, to, 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 to buffet him. So this man, Paul, he had a, a close encounter with the Lord. His relationship was special with the Lord, but he wasn't boasting about it. But here we see these uh, false prophets, these fly-by-night apostles in the Corinthians church. What they were saying is that they had a, a closer relationship with the Lord. They have a, 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 a more insight. They have better connection with the Lord. So Paul is saying to them, if you think that you have a closer connection with the Lord, you need to think this over again. Hallelujah. If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we. Brethren, all of us belong to Christ. 
You, you are not owned by Pastor Duncan. I know some pastors act as if they own their, their members. But nobody own you. Um, your, your pastor don't own you. We all belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, none of us have any special relationship with God in the sense that we can look down on another member. You can't, uh, I as a pastor, I can't look down on you guys and say, well, you know, I have a special relationship with God. And every time I call, God is going to hear me. And, you know, if I don't pray for a situation, the situation will not be solved. This is not, not how it operates. Every born again believer have the privilege that they can come boldly before the throne of grace. Where we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Hallelujah. So if you are sick, you don't need to get special person to pray for you. Any born again person could lay hands on somebody that is sick and pray by faith. And God is going to heal. You know, as I was saying last week. We don't have to have a special group of people who have to open this, the church in prayer. You know, we, we gather for our church service. We don't have to have a special individual to, to lead in prayer. I remember when I used to be at Light and Life Ministries, they used to have me as a special person to open up in prayer. And I said, listen, that is wrong. It is wrong. You're not supposed to have a special individual to open the church in prayer. And some people think, well, if this person don't uh, pray before the service, the service is not going to be spiritual. It's going to be dry. They say, oh, man, I, I like this individual to open up in prayer. When you open up in prayer, man, the spirit does move. And they act as if, well, some special person have to lead out in prayer. But any one of us, any one of us, we are all sons and daughters of Almighty God. But as many as received him, to them gave him power. To become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. Any person who acknowledges Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they have that power residing within their heart. He said, call upon me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Glory be to God. The eyes of the Lord run it through and forth throughout the whole earth to show himself strong. And on behalf of those whose hearts are perfect, we are his children. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then will I hear from heaven. Did you see anybody's name in that scripture? Did you see Pastor Duncan's name in that scripture? Did you say, say, if Eric, Eric Duncan? No, he didn't say, if my people, any one of us, we are all his people. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm so glad. Glory be to God that God don't have any special um, beloved son or special beloved daughter. You know, we as human beings, we have our favorite kid. You have your favorite son or your favorite daughter. You know, because uh, Johnny, he's not that compliant and he don't listen to you a lot. You don't have him done as your favorite. But the one who listens to you and when you talk to him, you know, he move quick. You know, you put him at the top. But God will operate like that. Every one of us are sons and daughters of Almighty God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we all belong to Christ. According to what the Apostle Paul is saying. For, for though I should boast somewhat more of our authority. Which the Lord had given us for edification and not for your destruction. I should not be ashamed. So Paul is saying here that because of the situation in the Corinthians church. The uh, false apostles they were boasting. And they were saying you know that they have special connection with the Lord. And uh, they have special inside knowledge and revelation from the Lord. So they force the hand of the Apostle Paul. This Paul is saying, you, have, you force me here to boast a little bit, somewhat. He said, because of what they were saying, I'm going to take the liberty and I'm going to boast somewhat, hallelujah, of the authority which the Lord had given us for edification. Those men in the Corinthians church, they were not genuine. They were not genuine bona fide apostles because God did not give them authority. But the apostle Paul, he was authorized by the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus ordained the apostle Paul and sent him to preach to the Gentiles. So if anybody should boast, it should be him because he was authorized from heaven. Praise the name of the Lord. It was the Lord who gave him that authority. And the authority that the Lord gave him, 
It was the authority to build up. The word they edify, it means to build up. You know, the Apostle Paul, he went to Corinth and he established that church and he built up the Corinthian church, went on his journey. From time to time, he will send uh, ministers like Titus and Timothy. You know, Apollos and all of these guys will, you know, go there by turns and they will build up the church. And here we see these false prophets and apostles in the Corinthians church. They want to break down the church. They want to demolish the church. They want to destroy the church. You know, look for instance, we are here in this ministry for about, uh, about eight years or so. And it takes us that period of time to build up this church by teaching and preaching you know, the word of God. You know, people are edified and the church is being built up. But do you know, it took us eight years to reach where we are, where we are at now. You know, in a little space of time, if we give the enemy a foothold, if we give the, the devil just one little hole in this ministry, in no time at all, what we build over that eight-year period will be destroyed. So what are we going to do? We're going to keep the enemy out. We're going to put up defense. We're going to use the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. As we studied last week, the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty true God for the pulling on of strongholds. Glory be to God. We can't allow the enemy to have any stronghold in this church. Because we allow the enemy to have a stronghold in this church, he will demolish the church. Satan doesn't come to edify. He's not there to build up. Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Brethren, we have to take a stand. You know, I was looking at this scripture and my mind focused on my marriage. You know, me and my wife, we are together for 37 years. And I'm not going anywhere because I love the cooking. I love how she respects me. Praise God. My wife, I like the way how she respects me. My wife, it doesn't matter what's going on. She respects me. She don't disrespect me in no way. And I don't disrespect her uh, either. My wife highly respects me. She highly value my opinion. If my wife going to do something, if she don't hear from me, she's not going to do it. Even though she know, um, well, this is right, she want to hear what I have to say. And sometimes, you know, I kind of, why well, you don't go ahead and do it? But she wants to hear from me. And she respects me. And, uh, you know, I, I love her for that. And I say I love the cooking too. I, I don't think there's any other woman out there who could cook as well as her, make it tasty. You know, <laughs> sometimes, you know, when she cook, uh, any little fault, you know, is in the cooking, I'll point it out. I say, I don't like what happened to that. Because it's not a custom. Uh, for instance, she made some bakes uh, yesterday. And uh, I said, they don't taste the way they're supposed to taste. You know, <laughs> and they taste okay, but it, it, like something is missing. So what I'm saying, we are together for 37 years. And it takes us 37 years to build up our family. And do you know that if we give the devil a little foothold in our family, in our home, what we take 37 years to build will be destroyed in no time at all. So what, what are we going to do? Are we going to just sit back and allow the enemy to come in to destroy it? No, I am going to get all of the spiritual security that I need to secure my family. You know, all of the, the whatever, uh, alarm, you know, you need to put on around your marriage, around your home. You have to secure yourself spiritually. Because if you're not secure, the enemy is going to destroy and this is what Paul is saying. The, the, the false apostles in the Corinthians church, their aim was to destroy the church. They wasn't there to build up. And Paul is saying that his authority that he received from the Lord is to edify. Hallelujah. We have to be on the alert for people who are on the prowl. And their one and only aim is to de destroy the church. You know, people who like division. People who like to sow seeds of discord. People who want to carry on a grudge in the church. Who want to hold animosity in the church. These things is a stronghold. And brethren, when we see these things going on, as soon as we, the Bible said we ought not to give no place to the devil. Don't give no place to the devil. And when we see these things happening, it's a place we are giving to the devil. And we have to take a stand. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
So um, Paul said that his uh, authority is to edify and, and not for destruction. Some you know, ministers use their authority to destroy and they use their, their authority you know, to split churches and to uh, get people to side, take side and separate. But Paul is saying here, his authority is to build. We need to build people up, surround people, build them up. Hallelujah. It is so easy to demolish a building. You ever see them demolish these big high-rise buildings? You know, maybe for, um, look at the World Trade Center uh, before it was destroyed. That building took them years to build. <laughs> and in no time at all, that building just collapsed. You know, they will, uh, these demolition companies, they will go into um, a big building, a building that is uh, condemned to be destroyed, and they will set all the different charges in the basement and different parts of the building. And when the time comes for them to, to press that button, in one strike, that building will just pan pancake. It just become like a, a pancake in no time. It's destroyed. It doesn't take a long time to destroy, but it takes time to build. It is harder to build than to destroy. And it seems as though some people, they, they take pleasure in destroying. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Paul said, I should not be ashamed. What they were saying is that Paul should be ashamed. And Paul had stuff in his life that he covering up. And he was abusing the people of God. Uh, he was using them to get money and stuff like that. And there are, uh, were hidden things in his life that he should be ashamed. So Paul saying that he is not ashamed. He don't have anything that he's ashamed of. And that is how we have to operate as children of God. We have to operate in the open. We don't have nothing to be ashamed of. Glory be to God. We don't have nothing in the closet. If there's anything in the closet, you need to bring it out. Jesus said whatever uh, things he said to us, we must uh, broadcast it from the house top. We don't have any secret. Praise the Lord. In verse 9, that I may not seem as if I, was, I, I would terrify you by letters. So what they were saying is that the Apostle Paul, he was terrifying them. When he sent his letters to them, because Paul established the Corinthians church... And then he went away and from time to time he will send Titus and Timothy and other brethren to visit the church. And uh, he will send them letters so that they can um, hear from him. And whatever things may not be in line, he will instruct them what to do. So here they're saying, Paul, you're terrifying us. You're intimidating us. And, uh, you know, what was happening here when Paul hear about something that is going on in the church, he have to correct them. And when you, as a minister, have to take the, the position to correct your members, you know, sometimes it is painful, but it is not terrorizing. You know, sometimes you have to, um, for instance, if you go to the doctor and you have an ailment and uh, the medication that the doctor gives you, if it's not working, when you go back to that doctor, he might have to give you something stronger. But is the doctor terrifying you? No, he's not terrifying you. He have to give you a stronger med medicine. And sometimes correction could be strong medicine. And sometimes when people get correction, they feel as if, well, the minister might be terrorizing them. And this is how the Corinthians church felt. They felt that the Apostle Paul was terrorizing them. He was intimidating them. They had a brother in the Corinthians church who took away his father's wife. And the Apostle Paul sent a letter to them and said, you have to um, discipline that brother you have to put that brother out of the church so that his spirit um, will be saved. His body, his flesh will be destroyed and his spirit be saved at the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it is all of these things that was going on in the church that the church at Corinth, they were taking issue with saying that Paul was terrorizing them. He was terrorizing them by his letters. Now listen to what he said in verse 10. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful. Now they acknowledge that the Apostle Paul, his letter was weighty and they were powerful. Even now, when we read the writings of the Apostle Paul, it is believed that the Apostle Paul has um, 13 letters in uh, the New Testament. There is, what, 27 books in the New Testament? And I think 13 of those books is 
um, attributed to the Apostle Paul. So the Apostle Paul, he, he writes a lot. And he make a, a great contribution to um, the writing of the New Testament. And here they are saying that his words, his letters, he said, um, for his letters say they are weighty and powerful. And it is true. Even when we read the writings of the Apostle Paul, you can feel the anointing. You can feel the power of God, you know, through the words that we are reading. And here they are saying that your words is powerful and weighty. And what they are saying, uh, Paul, when you write us in your letter, your words are so powerful. You know, you are, you are heavy handed and you are abusive. But his bodily present is weak. What they St. Paul, when he was way over on the other side, when you write us from over in Macedonia and you send your letter over in Corinth, your words are so powerful. But when we see you in person, Paul, you are weakling. <laughs> you, you are weak, weakling. You are coward. And this is what they're saying here. They're saying, Paul, you are wimp and you, you are not a strong person. Praise the name of the Lord. Say they. The, the letters are weighty and powerful, but his bodily present is weak. Also, there's a possibility that the Apostle Paul, he wasn't a strong person. He wasn't big and tall and, you know, strong, you know, like some people. And uh, when you read some of the um, historical writings that describe the Apostle Paul, they said that he was short, he was bow-legged, and he was um, bald-headed. And also his eyelashes. His eyelashes like it go right across. You know some people, it seems as though the eyelash don't have any break. <laughs> Bushy eyelashes. And uh, bald headed. And uh, his nose was like, he have a hook kind of nose. So it seems as though the Apostle Paul, he was not a pretty boy. He wasn't one of those kind of Hollywood kind of preachers. And uh, his looks didn't really turn them on. And that is what they're saying, Paul, you, you, you're ugly. You know, and you're, you're not fun to look at. According to how Ella Lewis does explain it. He's not that fortunate in his look. And uh, the Apostle Paul wasn't one of those Hollywood movie stars, according to what they're saying here. And listen to what they say at the end of verse 10. And his speech was contemptible. In other words, what they're saying, Paul, your speech is dis despicable. You know, you don't have any charisma in the way you talk. The way how you put your words... Your words are not that good. You are not that eloquent. We have to understand that at Corinth, the Greek-speaking people, they um, delight in people who can put words together. Most of the philosophers back in that time is from that um, kind of people. They like to speak and they like to address things in the proper way. And it seems as though the Apostle Paul, he wasn't able to put things in the way how they wanted to be. And that is why he said that, and I, brethren, when I come among you, did not come in excellency of speech nor of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For my speech and my, 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 my preaching was not of man's wisdom, but by demonstration of the spirit and of power. And he said the reason why he do that, so that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of God. That your faith should stand in the power of God. So the Apostle Paul, it, it, there's a possibility that he was not able to put words together to suit the Corinthians people. But his words was anointed. His words was powerful. Sometimes you listen to some preachers and they have all of those big words, highfalutin words that you have to, while you're listening to them, you have to have your dictionary open so you can understand what they're saying. And... Uh, you know, and people, oh man, I tell you, that is powerful. No, you know, sometimes these words are so big that nobody didn't understand what they're saying. But sometimes you have an ordinary man or ordinary woman who does speak on your level. And they speak, you know, broken English maybe at times. But because of the fact that the anointing, the anointing is upon that person. Brethren, it's not the highfalutin words that is going to break the yoke. The Bible says it's the anointing that is going to break the yoke. Hallelujah. It's the person who is anointed by God. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach deliverance to the captive. Glory be to God. It's the anointed word that is going to break the yoke and set the captive free. Praise the name of the Lord. 
in verse 11, let such and one think this, that such as we are in words by letter, when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. What is St. Paul? You're a hypocrite. You have a big mouth. You have, you have a big mouth. You're a bully and you have a big mouth when you're far away. But when you stand before us, you are chicken. You are coward. And Paul is affirming them. He's saying to them, listen, when we come, he said, uh, let such and one think this, that such as we are in words by letter, when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. Paul is saying that the same uh, way he expressed himself in his letters, when he come in person, he is going to be the same way. Glory be to God. He is going to be a man of his word. He's a man of integrity. And he will stand on the words that he sent to them by letter. In verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So what the false teachers was doing. They get up all of these different resumes. And they get people to give them all kinds of different commendation. Let, uh, reference letter to say you know, this about them and all these kind of things about them. And they start comparing themselves uh, amongst themselves. You know, who can speak in tongues and who can prophesy and uh, who is able to explain um, whatever um, subject that they might be dealing with. They are comparing themselves. They're saying, we are better. We can do these things better than you. And they are comparing themselves uh, with different ability. They have their own standard that they set. And they are complaining, uh, comparing themselves by themselves. But what the Apostle Paul said, but they are measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. And we have to take some instruction from that. We are not to be comparing ourselves among ourselves and measuring ourselves among ourselves. In other words, we say, you know, I, 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 when I lead the worship, you know, my worship is so anointed. And, uh, you know, when brother so-and-so lead, his worship is not that anointed, you know. Man, when I lead in the people, man, I tell you, they just spin. You don't see how them people just spin around when I lead in. And the anointing just move upon them when I lead in. And we start to make all of these different comparisons. The Bible says when you compare yourself by yourself and amongst other people, it's not wise. So who are we supposed to compare ourselves with? We have to compare ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the measuring rod. And you know what? When we compare ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, every time we compare ourselves with him, we are going to come up short all the time. Because none of us can be the way how he is. Every time we measure ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, we are going to see all of our shortcomings. But when you measure yourself with Pastor Duncan, or Pastor Duncan measure himself with the other pastor on the other side, or you measure yourself with the uh, worship leader, you are going to think that you are above that person. But when we measure ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, we always know that we have to find our place. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. We will have to take the place of submission. When we humble ourselves under the mighty hands of God, the Bible says we shall be exalted. For he that exalt himself shall be abased, but he that humble himself shall be exalted. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. In verse 12, for we did, um, did I read that one? Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Thank you. Uh, in verse 13, but we will not boast of things without our measure. But according to the measure of the rule which God had distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. So what they were saying is that, Paul, you are bragging about things that, you know, is not in your league. In other words, you are running out of your lane. You are in an area where you're not supposed to be. And Paul is saying here that God gave him the authority to even spread the gospel and to reach even to uh, uh, Corinth, to uh, reach out to the Corinthians and praise the name of the Lord. He said in verse 14, for we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure. What they were saying here, Paul, you're not supposed to be in this area preaching. You know, you cross the line. 
You should leave preaching in this area to us. You know, you're out of your area. You cross the bound. And they are telling the Apostle Paul, you, you are not supposed to be in this area preaching. All of the preaching in this area should belong to us. But the Apostle Paul was told by the Lord Jesus Christ to go and spread the gospel to the Gentile world. Anywhere Gentile people was, it was the place where the Apostle Paul was supposed to preach. So he was not out of his jurisdiction. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In verse 14, for we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reach not unto you. For we preach the gospel, for we are, are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. So Paul is saying that we preach the gospel all throughout those areas and the Lord give us the authority to even reach to you. And it is because of the preaching that we bring here in Corinth why this church is established. But even though the Apostle Paul, he was the father of the Corinthians church, the Corinthians people were trying to cut him down. And it's like somebody sitting on a tree. You're up on a tree and you sit down on a branch. And then you sit on a branch and you take a sap. And the same branch that you sit on, you start to cut off the branch. What is going to happen? <laughs> You're going to fall to the ground. And they were trying to cut down the, the very person who established them. And this is what we do from time to time. Sometimes you find that there's a, you have a minister who is on down on your level. And you know he's trying his best to establish things. And he's moving in a loving way with everybody else. Everybody. And you know there will be persons who will be trying to cut him down. You know they're trying to cut him down. And then you go in churches where they, you have those pastors who are bully. And they are abusive and they talk down to the members and everybody is so under subjection. By the time he says something, people are ready to move, you know. And uh, he will treat them in any kind of way. He will insult them. And these people still there, they're sucking it up under him and they're not complaining. But you have somebody who loving and caring with a congregation. And still they just try to uh, abuse the one who is loving and caring. And this is what they were trying to do to the Apostle Paul. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Verse 15, is it? Not boasting of things with, uh, without our measure. That is of other men labor. But having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. So what Paul is saying here, he's not boasting about things that he do accomplish. It's like some people, they will boast about things that never happen. They will talk about, oh boy, if you see how much people get saved. You know, we went to this crusade and, you know, sometimes you listen to these guys who go to Africa and they go to India. And you hear they come back and they say, oh, we was in India for a month and, you know, 50,000 people got saved. <laughs> and they will tell you about how much uh, amount of people get healed and stuff like that. And they blow up the whole thing. And there's no record to prove that. And they're doing these things to make God look good. But we are not making God look good. God don't want us to fabricate um, things. When something happens in the name of the Lord, we proclaim it. But if something don't happen, we don't need to make it happen. And uh, some people are trying to help God out. You know, we, 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 we say things. Oh, so much miracles and so much healing. You know, if healing happened, then we give God glory and we praise the Lord. If healing don't happen, we still praise the Lord. But what these men were doing, they were fabricating stories. They were forging different resumes and making uh, different commendations to make themselves look good. And Paul is taking a stand against these things. Hallelujah. We don't boast about things. Somebody asks you about your church. And, you know, I don't want to say I have a small church, you know, uh, you know. You know, we have a big church, you know. No, you would have a big church. If your church is small, your church is small. There is no shame. People ask me about my church. Man, listen, um, my church is not that big. You know, sometimes we up, sometimes we down. People come, people go. That is what I just say to people. I'm not going to be ashamed. It's not my work. You know, the Bible said Paul planted Apollos water. It's God who gives the increase. Uh, uh, my responsibility is to preach and teach the, the scripture. And I don't have to be ashamed, 
you know, the only way I'm going to be ashamed if I don't do what God wants me to do. But whether it's 100 people here or 50 people here or 30 people here, my responsibility is to preach the word in season. Reprove, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. This is what God called me to do. Praise the Lord. So hear what Paul said. This, this is a nice verse. Not boasting of things without our measure that is of other men's labor. So what he's saying is that he's not claiming something that other men labor in that was accomplished by other people. He is um, doing things on his own and he's establishing, he's putting in the work. And, uh, you know, when you look at this and we're talking about other men's labor, the uh, false prophets in Corinth, they were taking over the Corinthians church and that was not their labor. It belongs to the apostle Paul. It's he who established the church. But these men move in on him and it's other men's labor. And it's like today, you know, you will see people get uh, saved in a church and they will stay there for a few months or maybe a year and uh, they move on to another church. And uh, the person who plant that seed, he is not the one who is going to inherit it. And he's not the one who is going to taste up the fruit of the labor of that. Because in Canada, here especially, people go from church to church. People are just church shopping. And, uh, you know, you're over there and you don't like what the pastor is saying. The pastor decides uh, that uh, he's going to take a stand on fornication or adultery or whatever, and, and you don't want to stand for that, you pick up your bundle and you go on to the next church where the other pastor over there, he's, not, he's going to be silent and he's not going to talk about adultery, he's not going to talk about fornication, he's not going to talk about things that will upset you and you decide to settle down there. But you know, in Bible time, you couldn't just pick up your bundle and leave this church and go to the next church. Even when I become uh, saved in, back in St. Vincent in 1974, you couldn't go from church to church. If you in this church and something go wrong and you want to go to another church, you have to have a letter from the pastor. You have to go to your pastor and your pastor have to put down why you leave in the church and send and you for you to be accepted in the church that you want to go to, you have to take that to that pastor and he have to see what's in that letter. And if you are a cantankerous person, he had the option of saying, go back to your church and make it right with your pastor. But today, you know, because we don't have any growth in the church in Canada, people just going from church to church. And as soon as somebody comes through the door, you see them, you don't even find out where they come from. You don't even find out which part of hell they come from. And you're ready to grab a hold of them. And, you know, we have people going from church to church. But I'm telling you, it is God's will that the church that you become born again in, God wants you to set down in that church and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There will be times when the church that you become born again in, because the pastor um, is either he get off the rails and you know he's not listening to God and things may not be going. Uh, in, in the way it should go in a biblical sense and people might need to move on from that church and go to another place. If you're in a church where you are not being fed, if the pastor is not studying the word and he's not feeding you with uh, good food, then you have to move on. It's like if you go into a restaurant and they're not feeding you good there, you have to go to an next restaurant and God don't take offense to that. But if you're in a church where you are being fed, God expects you to sit long in that church. Not when the pastor says something that is upsetting to you. Pastor opened up the word of God and he started to preach. And, you know, he preached on church attendance. And then he preached and he said, uh, the Bible said we ought not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the man of some is. And you know that you ain't come to church for two Sundays. And you say, hmm, you pastor preaching on me. You're not going to see me again, no? You know, you pick up your bundle and you go on to the next church. Things like that. God don't acknowledge these kind of things. That is um, disobedient. It is disrespectful to the word of God. If the pastor preach something that is in line with the word of God, what we need to do, we need to fall in line. Hallelujah. We need to fall in line. If you need to repent, you need to repent and get your life straightened out. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. So um, this verse has something else again. He said, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but having hope when your faith is increased, 
that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. So what Paul is saying here, that when these people uh, settle down and they increase, when they get rid of the um, animosity and the division and the hatred that they have in the, in the church, the hatred that they have for the Apostle Paul, Paul is saying that they are going to increase. They are going to increase. And, uh, you know, it's not the pastor who is going to increase them. They are going to be so full of joy that the, the message that they receive, they're going to start spreading it. For this church to increase is not only Pastor Duncan alone, alone have the responsibility. All of us have the responsibility. I have to comp compliment uh, Brother Lewis and his wife for the great job that they are doing, spreading the word and bringing in people from time to time. But it's not just Brother Lewis. Uh, job to do that. It is all of us responsibility. All of us need to spread the word. We need to talk about what we have going here. If we have something good going here. If you are enjoying the word of God when we open up the scripture, you need to share that with somebody and invite them to come so that they can enjoy what you are getting. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In verse 16, to preach the gospel in the region beyond you and not to boast in other man's line of things made ready to our hands. So Paul's saying that he intends to go further. And he, he, he don't want to barge in and move in on other people's labor. He wants to go into other areas where nobody spread the gospel. And he wants to take the gospel further and further. But what they were doing, they were hindering the apostle Paul because of this hatred and animosity that they have Against the Apostle Paul, it was hindering the spread of the gospel. Brethren, hatred, animosity, bitterness. It's a dangerous thing. If you have hatred and animosity and bitterness in a church or in a marriage, in a family, it's going to destroy you. It's going to make you shrivel up. It's going to make you become weak. These things, it's a killer to spiritual strength. It will sap your spiritual energy. And this was happening here. It sapped the spiritual energy of the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth had people who were prophesying, speaking in tongues, interpretation, and all of these word of knowledge, all of these gifts were manifesting in the church at Corinth. But, you know, because of the animosity and the hatred and the bitterness that they have, the Holy Spirit can't move in the way that it ought to move. And it's the same thing that is taking place amongst us today. You know, in our churches, in our homes, because of the fact that we have this hatred and animosity and strife that is going on. You know, uh, God can move in the way that he ought to move. Praise the name of the Lord. And we are not gaining anything. We are losing. We are decreasing. Our strength is getting less and less. But let him that glory it, let him glory in the Lord. So Paul is saying, if anybody's going to glory... Glory in the Lord. What he's saying, don't glory in your knowledge. Don't glory in the fact that you speak in tongues. Don't glory in the fact that you have a, a house or you have a car. Don't glory in the fact that you have a government job uh, or you have money in the bank. Don't glory in the fact that you can go on vacation and other people can go on vacation. Those are not things for us to glory in. Hallelujah. Jeremiah said, let not the wise glory in his wisdom or glory in his strength or glory in uh, riches, but let him glory in the fact that he know and understand the Lord. We have to glory in the fact that we know God. The Bible talks about the people who glory in chariots, who glory in riches, whose strength is in their chariots and stuff like that. The book of Psalms talk about that. We are not to glory in material things. Brethren, the only thing that is going to last is our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. When we become born again and we acknowledge Christ as our Lord and Savior, this is the only thing that we can take out of this life. Praise the name of the Lord. When a person died, I was told that, you know, the suit that you see them put on, that nice tuxedo that they put on, they haven't, you don't have no pocket. <laughs> And uh, they said the reason why you don't need pocket because you, don't, you, you can't carry nothing. <laughs> I, have, I have a little pocket here because I'm alive. <laughs> you know, I can put my wallet. But when you're dead, you can't carry nothing. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. Somebody was talking about this guy. Uh, he said to his wife, when I die, I want to take everything that I own. 
So when he died, wife, you know, they're always obedient, you know. Anything we say to them, they listen, and they follow it to the latter. <laughs> uh, the wife, when he died, she take all of his money, and she get it in gold, and then she melt it down and put it in his casket. When he reach up in heaven, uh, he take all this big piece of gold, and he show it to Peter. Peter, look what I have. Peter say, what is this? This is, man, this is asphalt up in heaven, man. This is what we walk on up here. In heaven, gold don't worth nothing. It's what they make pavement with. <laughs> so what, what, what are you going to take? You, there's nothing we can take to impress God when we get to heaven. Hallelujah. Except having the Lord Jesus Christ in our life as our Lord and Savior. In closing, for he said, for not, so don't glory in material things. But hear what he said. For not he, he that commended himself is approved, but whom the Lord commended. You know what that means in simple terms? It's not the person who pat himself on the back and say, oh, you know, I'm so good. You know, I'm such a lovely boy. I'm such a lovely girl. I don't really, you know, I'm not really bad. You know, I'm so good. And, you know, you're patting yourself on your back and you say how good you are and stuff like that. And the Bible is saying that the person who pat themselves on the back and commend themselves and say how good they are, how righteous they are and, you know, whatever. The Bible says those are not the one who is going to be approved. God is not going to approve you when you pat yourself on the back. You, you have to let God approve you. Because he said it's not him who um, commended himself is approved, but whom the Lord commended. So we want God to command us. And what he's talking about there is when we get before the Lord, the Lord Jesus will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. We all want to receive that approval when we go before the throne of the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, glory be to God. The Bible said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man said, that shall he also reap. He that said to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that said to the spirit shall reap life eternal. May the Lord bless us. We will ask the musicians to come back. Glory to God. Uh, maybe put on it as well. It is well with my soul.